All right, everyone, welcome to the webinar. Uh, this is Safe, the co-founder of AI Hello. AI Hello is an Amazon PPC software company. We also offer managed services for sellers. We do everything from PPC to listing content, to, you know, uh, catalog work, pretty much everything that you need for PPC is done by us. We work with around 5,000 sellers between the managed service and the software. We're an advanced partner and we are the 18th largest spender on Amazon ads in the world. Today, I'm joined by some fellow speakers. We each have our own topic. I'm going to introduce my topic, and then we're going to go down the list to everyone, and they're going to tell you a bit more about what they're going to be speaking about and who they are and you know what company they represent. So for me, my topic is how PPC softwares work and why it beats manual management most of the time. I have a few examples from clients that we have worked with, and I also have some case studies for you guys to look to. So you know this isn't all talk, and we actually have the numbers to back this up. Uh, next up is Max, who is yet to join, so we're just going to skip him for now, and we are going to go to Dorian. Dorian, can you introduce yourself, your topic? Hi. Yeah, my name is Dorian. I run uh, two companies. One is called Unit 6, which is a creative agency, and the other one is called Kepler, which is a customer research tool, and today I'll be talking about uh, uncovering true purchase motivation, so uh, things that will help you to come up with ideas and uh, increase your conversions on the listing and to find out who your customers are and what do they care about. Awesome. Neil? So we're going to talk about systems and automation, building a process in place by which uh, you can grow through contractors and operators as opposed to employees and make that into multi-eight figures in business. Right. Perfect. Uh, next up is, let me just make sure I'm saying this right. Is it Claudio? Claudio. Claudio. Yep. Yeah, that's better. Hello, everyone. I'm Claudio. I'm the CTO of e-commerce. And uh, I also hold a, a PhD in statistics. And for me, it felt natural that today I speak about the mechanics and the technical aspects of this new paper, that or relatively new paper that Amazon released, Cosmo. Uh, a little bit about e-commerce. E-commerce is a full-service agency uh, helping brands expand on marketplaces and on D2C. We offer services like uh, account management, strategic consulting, retail media management, and uh, P more syndication tools implementations. So I look forward for today's conversation. I think it's a very hot topic and uh, yeah, look forward for your questions in the in the chat. Awesome. I guess I should have said Dr. Uh, Claudio if I knew. That's all right. That's all right. <laughs> All right, perfect. So after you, we have a Q&A session. So I'm going to begin right now. I'll just pop screen share open for us. And I'll take you through the deck that I have ready. If you guys just give me a moment here, I'll be able to open this thing right up. So share screen. Just give me a moment, everyone. Okay, here we go. Can everyone see my screen? Yep. Yes. Got it. Yep. Perfect. Let me just move us to the other side of the screen over here and hit present. Okay, present full screen. Here you present. All right, perfect. So over here, the topic is PPC software as a tool for growth and by extension, why I believe it beats manual management. In most cases, I'll cover this a bit more towards the end of the presentation. But the uh, first thing I wanted to cover here is why people even use PPC software. So there are multiple reasons, but these are the four biggest ones. And these are the ones that we've seen, you know, post working with these others and the things that we've been able to solve for them. And then also I just saw Max joined. So Max, you're next up. We're just started with the, uh, we've just started with the presentations here just because we were going over time. So yeah, so these are things that we've found out through speaking to setters who are signing up to our platform and things we've been able to solve for setters who currently work with us. The first thing is, it's just inconsistency with the human, uh, with like the human performance of people managing your account. Humans are good and they help with strategy and they can have insights obviously that the machine might not be able to have especially around how you distribute your budget, you know, which products to launch, uh, what spaces to get into, what categories to sell in. So humans are very useful and you can build, build their brand without a human just yet. But humans are also inconsistent, especially when it's like an employee or an agency or a freelancer that you found on Upwork. You know, these humans might go missing for a day. Maybe if you guys hire offshore, you've dealt with this before. Sometimes they go missing. 
sometimes they have no internet, um, no electricity. Sometimes they just quit on you. They find another job. You know, they got pregnant, they got married, they leave, they do a million other things. Sometimes they're just not bothered to work today. So they don't check your bed. They don't do all of the things that they should be doing, the negation, the harvesting. So you end up losing on some gains that you could have made and you end up spending inefficiently because sometimes they let things run that are mistakes, for example, longer than they should have. So the first thing that people use PPC software for is to deal with human inconsistency in terms of performance. The second thing is that some people just have a catalog that's just way too big to manage on their own. So what they end up needing to do is to use a software and just have all of the campaigns run through that software. Because if you have 4,000 SKUs, 6,000 SKUs, you're not going to sit there and create campaigns manually for every SKU. Even if you use bulk files, it's going to take way, way too long. You're not going to change bids for all of the keywords for 4,000 SKUs. So you end up needing to use software. Number three is you want to free up time to focus on needle moving tests. So if you're just sitting there on your own working on the PPC, spending hours like changing bids, hours creating campaigns, hours doing keyword research, hours harvesting, all of these things are not a waste of time because they obviously help your performance. But at the same time, they're not going to move the needle for you as much as finding the next star product launch, you know, figuring out how to lower your cogs or how to improve the uh, quality of your product or how to get more reviews or how to run off Amazon ads. So it actually frees up your time to look at more important things for your business. And finally, it decreases workforce requirements. So if you have a larger account or maybe you manage accounts for other people, the more work there is to do, the more people you're going to have to hire. So number one, you multiply the likelihood of things going wrong. Because if you have two people, it's twice as likely that one of them will quit, twice as likely that one of them you know, is going to have some type of issue. They'll need a week off. You know, They need 10 days off to travel with their friends in Europe or to do whatever else they're going to do. So you end up, number one, minimizing the number of issues that you're going to run, run into uh, for like HR stuff. And you also decrease the cost because a human is going to need a lot more money than software and software won't ask for a raise. It won't need a bonus. It won't need anything more than you're paying it each month. Right? So that's why people use PPC software, but what can it actually do for you? Number one is it can adjust bids on all of your keywords every single day leading to more efficiency and more gains on the strong keywords and less ad spend invested into bad keywords. Number two is it can add hundreds of keywords to your campaigns monthly. So through our keyword database at AI Hello, our AI and our harvesting features were able to add hundreds of keywords for each ASIN, depending obviously on the volume that ASIN is driving, but generally for each ASIN per month inside our clients' campaigns and that grows their ad spend and their ad sales accordingly. Number three is we can negate bad search terms. So if you have search terms that spend a bunch of money and you're not looking at them, and you know if you act up like a few hundred dollar bill and one of your campaigns will just go in, negate those automatically for you with our software. Uh, number four is we can actually create up to 20,000 ad groups in one go. This is based on our tool. Uh, you can do this for multiple products at a time, multiple countries. They have everything set up for you in a couple minutes. After that, we can decrease ACoS and grow sales. And this is through all of the things that I mentioned over here. So the new campaigns, the new keywords, the better bids and the negations. Uh, after that, we can also adjust placement boosts. So your placement boosts obviously affect your results. And the more you spend on your good placements and the less you spend on the bad ones, the more sales and the lower ACoS you're going to have. So we adjust those for you automatically. And then finally, we can also day parts. If you have specific hours or days of the week where you're doing better or worse than average, you can actually increase and decrease your bids during these hours to help you get the most like performance out of your campaigns. All right, so is this all just a sales pitch? Uh, the thing is that obviously every other PPC software company owner or agency owner or freelancer or anything is going to come out and say like, hey, I'm going to do all of these things for you. They're going to make your business grow. Your ACoS will fall. You know, your tackles will be halved. You know, everything's going to be perfect. So is this all just a sales pitch? And the answer is no. I actually have some real case studies. Over here, you can see this is through our dashboard. If you guys aren't familiar with what this looks like. Over here, you can see the before and after an account that we worked on. So you can see the total sales used to be 147,000 a month. It went up to 160,000. But the actual magic is that the tackles during this same period went from 33% down to 26.5%. So they were making essentially 5% or even a bit more, 6% in extra net margin. And they made more in total sales. And their ad budget actually went down. They stopped spending 48000 a month, and they started spending 42000 So that's six grand back in their pocket. And their total sales also went up by around 15000 
So how did we achieve this? We went from 10 keywords driving 90% of our traffic to harvesting over 50 keywords. And those 50 keywords contributed to the revenue of the product. We harvested more than that, but only 50 of them had the volume and the CPC that the client could afford and could actually move the needle for them. Number two is we stopped overbidding on those 10 initial keywords. So since we already had 10 keywords in the campaigns and we were only depending on those for traffic, uh, we were overbidding on them to try to get as much traffic from those keywords as possible because these 10 keywords were basically our entire business. But now since we had 50 other keywords to get traffic and sales from, we no longer had to overbid on those keywords, which allowed us to bring down our ACOS and TACOS. Then number three, we negated a lot of wasteful search terms that saved us thousands of dollars of ad spend per month. Right after that, we have this product launch. Uh, it was done entirely by our AI. So all of these campaigns that you see were set up in maybe three or four clicks through our tool. All of the keyword research was done by our tool. The harvesting was done by our tool. The negations, the bit change, like everything in the campaigns that you see in front of you were done by our tool. This is a product launch. Uh, we also did some managed service work for this. So some of the listing content was done by us. And we also enrolled this into Vine where we split up all the ASINs and we enrolled them into Vine separately. And then we turned them back into one parent and we ended up launching with something like 120 or 150 reviews, which obviously helped us get a better ACOS out of the gate. But over here, you know, 100,000 in spend, 318,000 in just ad sales, almost 319, honestly, in just ad sales, 32% ACOS all done through the software in a few months. So how did we achieve this? These campaigns were launched for a new product released in December. Everything out these campaigns was automated. So everything that I mentioned earlier, keyword research, harvesting, bidding, negation, the actual setup, all of this was done through the API by our tool. And now these campaigns, even though it looks like they've only spent 100K from December to date, which rounds out to about 16K a month, but this is actually skewed towards the end because right now they're actually spending $40,000 a month and they're producing probably, I think it was 110, 120 can get back with the actual numbers. Maybe I added this when I posted on YouTube, but six figures a month, seven figures a year on these products, never been touched by a human, other than the listing like work that we did, plus the Vine stuff that we did earlier. You know, finally over here, we have this day parting case study. So you guys can see in this account that we had certain drops uh, in sales accompanied by increases in ACOS. And you can see at the start, like ACOS was going up to 80%. Uh, you know, we had significant drops in sales. If you see the graph over here for sales, you know, ad sales over here, you can see in orange, like the sales dropped tremendously. Spend wasn't going down as much, uh, but we had, you know, super high ACOS during these periods and we ended up mellowing this out. We saved this account thousands of dollars per month. So basically this account used to sell products or still is selling products bought primarily by businesses. So during the weekends, their sales would just fall off and they'd be spending thousands of dollars on ads, on you know pretty much ads that would never convert for them. And we analyzed this trend and the software started decreasing the bid significantly every weekend to save money. And now our ad spend on bad ACOS days has dropped significantly. So then if you go back over here, you can see on the first few weekends, like we had a super high ACOS and then over time, it mellowed out to around the 40% ACOS uh, during the weekends, which is a lot better than what we used to have. And the ad spend also fell a bit during these periods, right? That's it pretty much it for my presentation. Uh, overall, what I'm trying to say is that PPC software is good. It's a tool that most sellers should be using. It's good to have a human there, especially if they're actually focused on the strategy, focused on how to allocate budget, focused on how to gain market share and how to beat out the competition. But at the same time, humans shouldn't be doing the bid changes, humans shouldn't be harvesting, humans shouldn't be doing negations. So if you are hiring someone solely for the purpose of doing these tasks, I just suggest automating them. If you have someone who's actually able to be there, get in the weeds with you and figure out how to grow the business outside of these things, then that's obviously valuable to have. But I'd run a PPC software tool on your campaigns in parallel with that. So that's pretty much my presentation. Next up is Max. Max, you haven't given a introduction yet because you joined a couple minutes after us. So if you can just tell us what your name yeah. is, who you are, and start presenting. Well, luckily, it's on the first slide of my presentation. So let me share my screen, uh, and I will do that as well. Um, okay, here we go. Um, slide show. So, uh, yeah, my presentation is 
Cosmo and Rufus, because uh, also uh, Claudia is going to cover a bit of Cosmo as well, uh, optimizing for the future of AI powered search. So I'll put on a timer as well. Okay. So a bit about me. I am the founder and CEO of eContent. Uh, eContent uh, helps sellers to uh, generate, optimize visual written content with AI. So we generate lifestyle images, infographics, optimized copy. Everything we do is is optimizing for 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 Cosmo. Um, and yeah, I uh, before that I uh, was uh, I studied uh, deep learning at the Mila uh, Institute of AI in Quebec. Um, I spent six years at Amazon. Uh, specifically, I worked in. Um, I, I helped to launch Amazon Singapore. I was in charge of browse and catalog quality, browse nodes, all of this good stuff for, for the launch of that marketplace. Um, so yeah, that's a bit about me. Um, and yeah, e-commerce is about to radically change. So there's two key things that people should be thinking about. Um, first of all, the launch of kind of conversational based search. And second of all, the launch of AI agents where we may not even visit Amazon or Walmart or wherever in a few years time, we may have AI assistants doing this shopping for us. But Amazon has now rolled out um, their kind of conversational based uh, search called Rufus, which looks like this across all US, US customers. Walmart has a, a similar one. They actually had it earlier. eBay, who are one of our investors, uh, similarly going to launch something soon. Uh, Google have um, kind of the uh, AI summary. So we, we, we're we going to be moving to this kind of AI-powered uh, conversational chat GPT style search. Um, and the reason that I think we're going to be moving there is it's such a better customer experience. So as I mentioned, I, I set up the browse nodes in, in uh, Singapore. Uh, one of the big problems of the catalog in Amazon is you search, put something to search currently, like classic book for a six-year-old girl's birthday who likes dogs, um, you get a load of junk back. So you get a, you know, these this is the actual search result. You get kind of books for two-year-olds, books for babies, sponsored products. You put that into a, a conversational model like a chat GPT, and it understands the intent behind the query, and it will give you a good book uh, like Charlotte's Web. And this is without any of the kind of... Uh, training uh you know chat gpt has not been trained on e-commerce e uh unlike amazon uh which has been trained with with cosmo which we'll get on to um but yeah when i, when I started at amazon in 2016 30 percent of searches were on mobile and now 80 percent of searches start on mobile and i believe uh strongly that this uh ai kind of search experience uh as they call it rufus a kind of conversational search is going to be a steeper gradient, steeper adopter gradient than mobile. And eventually I believe we'll, you know, I I, I can see by the end of the next year, 50% of people uh, you know, starting their search on mobile. So uh how do you reach a future proof for this? Uh this is the big question that we are working on at e-content. It's a fascinating question, and I will share how how I'm thinking about it um three ways. Firstly, intent-based matching. Um so keywords are becoming less important uh, and I'll explain why on the next slide but what's more important is kind of this intent based uh, based matching secondly visual content um these AI models are multimodal they can understand images as well as text and therefore you 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 know SEO is no longer just about the 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 text it's also about the visual content and lastly uh monitoring and optimization so keywords don't matter as much um, I will give, this is a an expert from Cosmo paper. I'm not going to go into too much details because I only have 10 minutes uh, on, on the kind of science behind Cosmo, but I'm going to explain very briefly why keywords don't matter as much. Um, and it's simply a function of this technology. Um, language models, large language models, LLMs, they work on a token basis. They don't work, you know, on a word basis, like the A9 algorithm worked on kind of uh, ranking words. It's not how this technology works. They will convert a prompt into tokens, tokens and numbers, and then they will compress the prompt and put it into the LLM. Uh, so if you're targeting a long tail keyword, um, that may, you know, that might, that's probably not even going to get into point one of this Cosmo algorithm. Um, because of the compression and because of the conversion into tokens before you go into the knowledge and the kind of Cosmo algorithm itself, which uh, I think we're going to have a later speaker on. But what matters 
far more is intent. Uh, so, for example, if a um, a woman searches for uh, uh, a pregnant woman searches for shoes on Amazon uh, without her telling Amazon she's pregnant, Amazon will know this because they have the data on her, and without uh, you know her her looking for slip resistant shoes, Amazon will surface to her slip resistant shoes. Uh, because they understand the user behavior and they understand the intent behind this. And what we will need to be optimizing for now and what we're doing at e-content is optimizing for these things here, for seasonality, for location, uh, you know, uh, explaining how the product, you know, the audience of the product, where it's used, all of these fa uh, features, which kind of in some are intent, is, is kind of more important. Um, and as I mentioned, it's not just about the copy. Amazon have... Um, the, the le world's leading kind of image recognition software. You can uh, buy this as a third party on AWS. They can un they can uh, un see the words and images, and they can see the 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 composition of images, the scenes, etc. And that's going to be just as important, uh, or, or is just as important for ranking in Cosmo, as um as as what we have currently uh, with the text based SEO. And soon. And this is, I, I believe, Jeff Bezos' master plan. Search will actually start with speech. So think about how we talk and how different that is to kind of searching keywords on Amazon. 32% uh, of US homes have Alexa. 20% of people use uh, your voice search on mobile with perplexity or, or Siri or whatever else. 50% of people already in the US use voice search daily. I'm one of them, although I'm not in the US. Um, so... I believe this the future we're moving into is going to kind of be a mix of a kind of like conversational based uh, Rufus kind of chat GPT interface I showed you on an earlier slide plus speech is uh, and that is how search is going to be and Cosmo is going to be the back end of that so I didn't put any more details in because I didn't want to clash with uh, with the 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 second uh, with Claudio um, but what I can share is. Um, we have this kind of uh, free uh, Cosmo audit GPT. It's a GPT that we've trained on um, uh, all the science papers and and the data we have at e content. I'm I you know I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of place a placeholder and say that GPTs are not connected to Amazon API. It doesn't have the data that that you the, everything you may like. And um, sometimes GPTs can hallucinate. We know this about Chat GPT. But if you want to see how your ASIN is faring on Cosmo, here's a good place to go. Uh, and then finally, my last slide, I'll, I'll talk about what we're doing in e-content. So, you know, this is an excerpt from our patent. We look at the listing data, uh, we're looking at the, the target demographics, and we're using that to generate the visual and written uh, you know, lifestyle images, uh, infographics, and also the, the text, uh, whilst maintaining the marketplace specific requirements and looking at tom similar top selling listings. So, uh, yep, that's the, the presentation. We have 10% off uh, e-content is special for, for you guys here. And, um, uh, you know, you can find me on LinkedIn. You can find me on email. Happy to discuss any of this further. It's something I'm super passionate about and very excited about. So, yeah, happy to, to, to kind of talk, um, yeah, as we need to. And I think hopefully that was 10 minutes. Very perfect. No, this is good. I was surprised by some of these stats there. Like I didn't think 32% was it had like an Alexa at home or 50% of people used voice search. This is super interesting. Uh, is your tool like, sorry, do you offer a tool or a managed service? Like you guys create the images using AI? We or... are a SaaS platform. So the customer logs in, they integrate the Amazon store based on that data. They generate optimized content um, uh, based on the brand analytics and the other places. Um, so yeah, we, we, we're not a managed service. We, we are SaaS. So content is in like titles, bullet points, bullet points, lifestyle images, infographics, A plus content, all of the product listing. This is good. I will probably be reaching out because we do there like we go. <laughs> thousands of images per month manually right now with like graphic designers, copywriters, even me personally, I used to make these images myself back in the day. So I'll probably be reaching out if you guys can produce good images. Yeah, look, look to, forward to it. Just for everything. Uh, no, this is good. Up next, I think we have Dorian. Dorian, would you want to present yourself now? Yeah, give me a moment. Mm, okay. One sec. I just need to check my screen. Okay. All right. Can you see it? 
Yep, I can see everything. <laughs> so today we're going to talk about conversions. <laughs> so apparently I have only 10 minutes, so I'll go through this quickly. And my topic today is conversions. Um, so just quickly about myself. So I'm a creative director. I've been working for 11 years with brands, uh, Fortune 500 companies. Uh, used to work with uh, PNG, brought them into Amazon. I'm a partner at Unit 6 Studio, which is a creative agency. Recently also uh, a graduate in applied, da applied data science at MIT. I'm a founder of Keplo. Um, also recently uh, launched a, a really cool community called Conversion Club. And I love cooking a little bit of, uh, uh, about me. I think that's enough. Uh, while running our conversion club recently, I, re I realized that most brand owners do not optimize conversions for a very simple reason, which is not being able to come up with ideas to test. Um, so today I will tell you, in the, hopefully in the next eight to nine minutes, how you can constantly come up with new ideas and how to run A-B tests and increase your conversions drastically within, uh, let's say, two to three months. Uh, so let me just start with this. Nice design doesn't sell. Really bad one either. I've been running an agency for 11 years and I'll tell you some of the bad, bad listings, they do convert like crazy for very specific reason. So we have three main buying behaviors. We have intent base, influence and impulse. And this is like actually going to tie really nicely with what Max was talking about. So, um, so this is gonna tie really nicely. Uh, so a large portion of Amazon traffic comes from customers who visit the site with a specific purchase in mind. So Amazon is not about like impulse uh, buying or m maybe a bit of influence, but it's or usually I'm going, I wanna go to Amazon to buy something. So today we're gonna talk about intent. Uh, the main uh, the, the main focus of today of, of this presentation, otherwise known also as purchase motivations. So here's an example of one, and how many times we have said that uh, every single year. Um, but this is where the intent starts. This is the first stage. It's time it's time for me to get back in shape. That's my intent. So that's the first step. The next step, okay. The next step would be. I, I just need some, you know, I probably need shoes. I might need, you know, this running gear, uh, maybe a yoga mat. I don't know. You know, let's, 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 you know, let's make a list. But then the third stage is uh, product specific. So, and this is where our, uh, brand owners need to pay their attention. Um, here's, we need to start, for example, this is, um, um, you know, when we're looking at water bottle, it's what kind of budget do I have? What kind, how much am, am I willing to spend? What type of bottle am I looking for? What features am I expecting? What benefits am I expecting from, from this product? So how do we find out all of this, right? If we know, if we, can, if we can portray them and we know exactly what customers want, that would be ideal. Like we could create an ideal product or ideal marketing, but there are ways to do it. And uh, I guess some people here that run software companies know of this beautiful beautiful thing that we all do in SaaS companies, they're called user interviews, and they give you so, so much information, but it's really, really hard on Amazon, right? Then the main thing where I see brand owners doing is mostly time guessing. Uh, so to clearly understand buyer's intent and purchase motivations, and we need to start talking to our customers and stop guessing. It's not about what we think the customers want. It's about finding out the truth. Um, so become customer obsessed. Who are we selling to? What do they care about truly? So here's an example, an example of what will help you come up with A-B test ideas. Uh, and we're looking for specific keywords and phrases. So for example, here we have intent based keywords and phrases. It needs to be light. So light is one of them. It needs to be large because I want to be, uh, you know, I want to get hi uh, hydrated. Quick access, spill proof, modern design. It needs to be a sports bottle because I want to get in shape. So you can see these little uh, keywords, light, large, quick access, spill proof, modern. These are intent based keywords and intent based phrases that uh, basically customers are looking for. And you have to reflect them in the content. So here's an example of uh, the text in green, actually. Uh, it's it's intent based keywords that you can put in your title. And this will get this will get picked up by Rufus. This will get picked up by Cosmo. But also, this is what customers sometimes, and actually sometimes, a lot of the times, they also uh, use those keywords to search for products. So for this one, was for drinks and smoothies. That's one of those intent-based keywords that we found out. Um, so one thing that we've done is we've put it in the title. 
but we also put it in the main image for drinks and smoothies. And suddenly we, you know, after testing, we saw, I'm not joking this one, I got this data literally uh, last month, 377 increase uh, in sales from that, from, these two, from that intent based keywords for drinks and smoothies, and then that little drink and smoothie in the main image. Here's an, another example listing that I've worked some time ago. Um, and I was talking to the brand owner. I was talking to the brand owners and I asked him, so what's this, who's this product for? And he goes, it's for hardcore preppers. You know, it's, it's a quality survival gear. You know, this, we, need, we sell into these folks. And I was like, okay, let me do some, let me do some user interviews. This is what I found out. Most people that buy this product are actually families and couples and they use it for emergencies. And the main intent, uh, the main intent for this product was to put it in the cars in case of it's raining or case of an emergency in a car. And that was the main reason people were buying this. So by putting this in the title and uh, creating, the, uh, creating the images, bam, again, the, um, the, the, the conversions and the click the rates uh, went up. Uh, what's also is really important is to understanding what's uh, kind of the, the, the importance of everything. So not everything is important. So you have to understand uh, what, which of these intents, you know, come first, second, and third, because you can really uh, easily overwhelm uh, the listing with just, you know, packing too much of it. So a lot of research and a lot of testing. So how to get those intent based uh, keywords, how to understand this. So uh, this is uh, me. So me and my team have been creating Amazon listing since 2013. And on average, we're able to launch a listing a day. So I had five, I had five full time researchers digging through listings and making this qualitative inferences all every single day for our customers and for our internal brands. But this new technology that just emerged, which is, you know, these beautiful LLMs allowed us to try something new. So I have hired an amazing team of developers, data scientists, and we created this new tool called Keplo, which can do all, the, all that for you in a matter of 20 minutes. So our goal was to create it for ourselves, but at the same time, we kind of packaged it. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, we mostly use it internally, but it's also out there for you to use it. So here's a quick example, how to get those intent-based keywords. So here's a magnesium complex supplement. Um, and very quickly, we can, you know, we can scrape all the data, all the reviews and everything. Uh, and then you get something which is called main buyer intent. So it actually turns out that magnesium is being uh, used mostly as a natural sleep aid. So people are using uh, the main intent for people. And I can, you can also see it in the usage pattern. So the main pattern, the main reason, the, the main way people use it is to enhance the sleep. So that's a very important thing that you can potentially use in your keyword. You can potentially somehow put it on your packaging. It's mostly female as well. So that gives you an idea. And here's one example also here of a listing that I was reviewing for a client. And turns out that this listing was all about sports, all about running and uh, running and just, you know, a lot of male, a lot of like masculinity. And I was like, okay, let's try, let's try, you know, let's, you know, this, here we have an opportunity to a b test how about you know we put to, we create some images of female uh, and focus on the sleep uh, sleep uh, intent so the only thing you have to do is come up with those the ideas pick up those intent based keywords pick up pick up those usage patterns and then test them so um the thing is I, as much as i love ppc um and some people probably will disagree conversions are mostly uh, the, the most profitable way to scale your business. You have to fix your conversion first after you start pouring that PPC money. Because if you start pouring that PPC money on a listing that doesn't convert, that's like pouring water into a leaky bat bucket. So that's all, of, uh, that's all from me. I hope that was 10 minutes. And guys, if you want to learn more and join our awesome, uh, awesome, awesome community, uh, go to Conversion Club. Uh, and we uh, we we uh, we launching a new cohort in September, and that's all from me. Thank you. Yeah, perfect. No, this is good. This is good. I've been doing most of this stuff manually uh, at our company, like reading the reviews, figuring out who's buying, why they're buying, how they're using this. And it takes like hours per listing. Like if you're actually doing the work right and you're actually putting time into it, you could do like two, three hours of research for a single listing, especially if you have like a lot of reviews to go through. So this is super good. I'll actually probably be booking a demo 
it's Kaplo, right? Kaplo is the actual yeah. platform. Yeah, Kaplo. I just booked, uh, I just submitted like a demo form for Max like a couple of minutes ago. I'll be booking with you guys too then because you do all of this stuff manually. And, you know, obviously I talk about automation and AI for PPC. So you to back this stuff up with the listing content stuff as well. So I'll probably be booking a demo as soon as this webinar is over. All right, Neil, you're up. Awesome, guys. Thanks for joining. I appreciate it. That's some good information. I'm taking some notes. So you guys are uh, <laughs> you're rocking this out. So let me grab my uh, screen real quick and figure out where I can get the portion of my screen shared correctly. Let me know when you guys can see this. Okay, I'll focus this in here. Yep, looks um, good. Awesome, great. Guys, so my name is Neil Twal. I'm the CEO of Voltage uh, Holdings. We are a consulting, management, growth, and acquisition M&A firm. So what I want to talk to you guys today is about making sure that all the good tactics these gentlemen uh, are talking about. I just had Max talking with Cosmo on my podcast the other day, and we went deep into that. So I encourage you to check out the High Voltage Business Builders podcast, where we went even deeper than some of the things he, he said today. And I know I only have 10 minutes, so I'm going to talk quick because I have a lot of things I want to cover through optimization systems, human automations, right metrics of growth and the purpose of the business and these metrics of growth and stuff really are going to culminate the strategy of business development growth eight figures uh and my experience in m a acquisitions and the companies we're going to be buying uh this year and next year so what i want to talk to you about is um, the first part of that which is getting into optimizations of the business so as you do automated product research or listen to these smart gentlemen talk about ways to tactically move through the business model uh, I want to make sure we understand a process and methodology for developing product pipeline that makes those tools work and amplify even better uh, with good product data. Because in essence, what they've been saying and what I will say, and hopefully you will hear from this today, is that good product data is uh, really what it takes to make those AI tools work, to make those systems get dialed in. And the process by which even your title or Cosmo or Rufus or any of these things are going to work is very important in understanding the metrics that get behind that. The tracking and aspect of this, we use Trello board. So I'm just going to give you some of the processes and tools we use uh, that you might uh, use in your business or amplify Trello board for project and pipeline management uh, to ensure timelines are being met. We move through the cards. It's very easy to track and manage as a team uh, how that works. Our green light process, I'll go through that in just a minute in the tactical, but it's basically just defining a product market competition using POE and proprietary data to go through and determine a product uh, probability index that will say this demand capture is available on Amazon. How fast can we get it? How much can we take over and how quickly can we ramp it uh, and do it profitably at the very bottom line? So everything about net profit, net profit minimums, that leads to growth in the portfolio. And as the portfolio grows, of course, the business becomes profitable. Uh, you can't run a business by a gut feel. We do objectives and key results, standard objectives, standardized key results. It's pretty simple. Once you define it for each business, 80% of the processes will apply to any business, either built or acquired. So really it gets down to what's the 20% difference in that business, that brand, it's market share, the time in market competition, et cetera. Those don't take a huge amount of time to define. So your business should be able to fit within a specific OKR for product development, research pipeline, customer support, uh, optimizations and using tools and tool sets like you've heard about today to create those optimizations for growth. And of course, we use automated chatbots, AI chatbots to access that knowledge. We've built it into our VChat system. So we have a bot for each thing from Amazon compliance to research to policies, and of course, to training and education that is easily accessible 24-7. Uh, that is constantly updated and human curated on the back end to assure compliance of that and that allows quick you know quick access to good data and increases both human iq and allows us to keep uh, information and knowledge in a singular location should a person fall out or an operator change that human intellectual capital stays within the organization and continues forward uh, that's a redundancy and a plan of action as every business owner should have in place uh, to return the results that you want from the business. But of course, should something happen to you, you must be thinking about what it takes to replace you in that business and not just be a single man operator, which I consider to be a side hustle or a hobby business, but actually turn into an organization that deploys multiple resources beyond you, uh, creating automations that allow you to free up your time, energy and attention, and of course, allow you to deploy money faster and easier. Some of those systems of automation we use is what we call a green light dashboard with automated product research and a tool we call Note Hunter. So it actually goes out as compiling data, building in petabytes of information in the back end and reanalyzing with our algorithms and displaying products that we already have an 80% confidence, a demand score, it's capturing information 
uh, from the PoE dashboard now, and we're uh, putting that into the process by which we can then just determine demand and capture and pick a product, go straight to our manufacturers, and test launch 100 units of that product very quickly. So as we go through that process, it creates an iterative change in new business or existing businesses or businesses we're purchasing in which we want to amplify their product line quickly uh, and then manage that backwards into Trilio board to keep the tracking updated. We do AI PPC management software. I know that SAFE is very, very good at that. Uh, so we use that to automate PPC and automations. We don't do it, just so you guys know, in the first seven and 21 days of a product launch. During that organic period of validation, impressions, and tracking and clicks, we're basically seeing how close did we get to the competition inside Amazon's own AI engine. Now we know this is going to change. With Cosmo, we've talked a lot about it. As I mentioned, uh, Max and I jammed on that the other day. So we are prepared and automated to get into the position to accept Cosmo as a change and only see what we believe will be amplified better results than what we're seeing now. It's gonna be more focused with even a 0.7% return on CTR from their 10% test of the whole model we would expect to see similar results being lifted up in our brands as long as we're aligned with that. So we work very closely to get all those listings and, and obviously get that in place. We use OnGuru for those who want to know a name. We use that for listing creation, optimization, and tracking uh, of keywords on fires and specifically tacos or total advertising cost of sales. That's one of our primary metrics. In fact, I will say something that will probably hurt people's feelings or minds. I don't care about a cost and I don't care about yours. What I care about is your total advertising cost of sale and your customer lifetime value, because I will go into the market and buy up the customers you won't spend on your 30% A cost. I will spend 130% to acquire them with the specific intention of turning them in 90 and 180 days into a larger CLTV that equals up to $1,000 of a prime member purchase in 12 months from that product line. So I'm thinking 12 months, you need to be thinking 12 months, or we're not going to be competing with each other at the same level. Seller board for automated inventory and tracking just helps us keep logistics just in time freight and management. It's tracking and doing a very great job of ensuring product pipelines meet expectations and logistics of uh, inventory turnover to ensure that products do not stock out. We use mid journey for brand image creation product placements and or chat GTP depending upon the output, which means we can now skip photo shoots and in use photos altogether. That is all now done through things with in painting like Photoshop. Uh, online AI, so we can literally do an entire photo shoot, hyper-realistic, and don't have to go into a location anymore. That saves a huge amount of time compression. Claude AI will go against graphic copy, marketing copy, will take other copies and combine them. Claude is closest. Uh, when you play with the model and dig into it quite uh, deeply, you can get you know closest natural language copy I've seen yet and pass most all AI detector tests. So for that reason, I know we're staying in compliant and it always has a human interface with it because we someone will overlook the copy and change the copy just to ensure compliance. VidIQ for any targeted keywords means we will go optimized into YouTube. YouTube gives us opportunity to target organic traffic by keyword and then back it up with Google ads uh, behind it with targeted uh, attribution links for best selling keywords. That simply just amplifies in, you know content at the organic side of YouTube, but also pushes it back uh, and grows over time. That's not terribly difficult to do. The software does it extremely fast. It's all AI driven, gets the copy, the graphics, the images, and scores everything, makes it really simple and push button on the SOP. We always use PicFu for image. Im I should have put that one in reverse, my PicFu bullets ahead of that, but um, image optimization and prime buyer feedback from the very beginning through every optimization stage uh, that we continually do. We are always looking to take a little bit more uh, percentage of CTR for images, and we will constantly be moving images into PicFu and out uh, to allow the ability for conversions to continue to increase uh, and do not let listings set out there for more than 60 days that have not been touched with some optimization in that process and tweaked very slightly. So that leads to opportunities for things like human in automation, right? Which means training operators as business owners. I used to have employees. I used to have 21,000 square foot of warehouse, got rid of all that. So what I did was I started training operators as business owners and then bringing them on, on profit share for different businesses. We manage client businesses we control or businesses we acquire. So I actually have trained expert business owners running the other businesses. And because of that, the OKRs are extremely simple because they already know how to run the business and now they're helping me operate other businesses. So we have simple meeting and status checkups, uh, could be less than 15 minutes, or we just have a, an audio checkup to ensure compliance is going on and they don't need me to micromanage anything they're doing because they already run a business of their own and now they're running additional businesses with us. So we adapt to market changes. Objectives will change based on certain things. We've changed key objectives recently because Cosmo and Rufus and other things are coming 
And we know we've got to stay ahead of that, stay in compliance, stay forward. Business logistics and freight uh, costs are changing, so we got to stay ahead of that. And as you know, and why we're here today, uh, continually train on new AI options to time compress things down and make them faster and easier. Because when we're competing with human automation and AI automation, in some places, humans are still outperforming AI. In other places, you simply cannot compete without uh, AI-driven tool sets. Again, training the operators and uh, versus and employees has returned 10 times the returned 10 times the results because now I have ownership in a business with another owner and they are much more driven. So uh, that has changed the results, the speed of execution and the output. Uh, we built that training system we called Howie that is based on VChat bots around all Amazon terms of service curated product researches and 12 years of product data research, things around compliance, even our SOPs. Uh, are put into there. So we have basically 24-7, 365, constant uh, adaptation and curation of that. So what are the final metrics of growth here as we kind of wrap this up? Systems of AI and research, here's my targets for those products, the output, the business, and of course, any tools or automations behind that that simply amplify what's working. I only target products that are 50 to 200 in retail. I cross-reference that data to determine demand capture from product opportunity to explore and then determine whether or not I can see the five to 10, literally only five to 10 competitors in which I'm going to target and go destroy. It's just a matter of time. That means I'm gonna have more profit than them. So I have a minimum of $12 in profit margin. If they already have 13, I want 24. I'm always looking to get more profit out of the product and existing product marketplace because I'm going to outmaneuver them through optimizations and PPC management. That means the BSR is typically between 50,000 and 100,000 for my target products, even though I know my ultimate vendor and market share competition will be down below 10,000. I don't start there. I'm going to build up. I'm going to stack that pyramid up until I go towards the top. So many people jump in at the top and then fail to ever reach the bottom of the market. I actually inverted that and went the other direction. Keywords must have more than 10 million searches. So we go highly targeted, optimized, and we got a barrier of entry for certain products that we will or will not sell. We sell nothing under $30 on Amazon. We are all about profit-driven growth, not units of revenue or vanity metrics like how many units you move a day. It is the profitability of the product and the market share I can go, which means we target a minimum 20% EBITDA on each brand that builds the business, a target TA cost of 8 to 15% or the product will not meet the requirements of our strategy for dominating in a particular niche or node. And of course, an organic balance we prefer is 70%, 30% PPC. While listings are around 50-50 on the organic, we are always getting organic above PPC uh, in the way we do our methodologies. There's a reason for that, because this AI system, you may not know it, is actually going to uh, decrease what's called an IDQ score in the first 21 days if you touch it with ads before organic kicks in. If you touch it with ads before organic kicks in, your IDQ score goes down. As you might know on other platforms of purchasing and AI systems and stuff that's happening in Facebook, etc., once you get targeted on a purchase and acquisition, they will lock you into that and basically throttle your organic. I have learned over the years that Amazon's AI system does the same thing. Once organic is dialed in, PPCs are coming in later on and automation comes in later on with PPCs, but only after we prove organic sales, impressions, clicks, et cetera, before we add PPC. That way our IDQ score stays as high as possible and organic reach can be gained going forward as opposed to requiring PPC and then shutting off PPC and watching the whole thing end. Can't tell you how many times I've seen that. So our goal is to grow more than 10% year by year, get to more than a million in EBITDA between three to four years, exit the business and redeploy capital uh, every year for growth so that profits in two and three come uh, ahead of time. And that's a meaning we can continue to grow without capitulating the business, but take profits out of it in year two and three. By year four, we're setting that up for an exit. So what are the results? When you do that, you get AI research, AI data, AI photo shoots, AI commerce, AI listings, AI PPC campaigns, literally systems of automation in which time compression has made a huge difference in the way that we can run multiple brands in parallel with one operator running up to four businesses, even at six and seven and multi seven figures. That gives us the ability to build out a brand campaign and a portfolio so we can acquire more businesses, as I mentioned, which is our big deal. Operators go fast. We dial in PPC 30 to 60 days on each launch. And the goal is, of course, optimization of time for the operator and those who are involved, including ourselves, and doing all that in around 20 to 30 hours a week once it's all sort of dialed in. And those are businesses that are seven or eight figures and running. So I know I'm going fast, but in simple terms, if you want to compete in 2025, 
You're going to need to match machine to machine head on, or you're simply going to spend too much time, energy, attention, and money trying to keep up with human battling machines. It just isn't going to happen. It's changing so fast, you got to keep up with it. And remember, as I always tell people, building the business in the end uh, is the business model. Building from the beginning with the end in mind is how every business should go, which means that you're willing to not necessarily create capitulation because of profit or what I take out of the business early on, but it is growing the business year two and year three, which matches Amazon's own growth and algorithmic metrics. After 12 years, we've seen products that launch one year by year two and year three, they gain tremendous market share when positioned correctly. Amazon literally on a call the other day with us finally admitted this. I don't know how we got to the answer, but they finally told us uh, the answer matched our expectations and what we had seen. 5% of all SKUs launched in 2024, excuse me, all SKUs launched in 2024. Only 5% of all of Amazon sales will end up in this year on those SKUs. The same SKUs 12 months later, okay, in year two, will jump to 20% of all of Amazon's revenue. The same SKUs alive, growing well, and gaining more market share by year three will then take up 40% of all of Amazon's revenues. When you understand that, that you will understand the business opportunity you have and why you may have limited your focusing and belief on this business as an opportunity because you simply haven't given it the time to mature in the system um, by the system's own growth and metrics. It's very important we understand that. If all that strategy came at you extremely fast, but you wanna read about it and go through uh, 15 different experts compiled from my podcasts, people like Max and others in the back have written uh, into these uh, chapters, the different experience around my playbook in, in encompassing my five by five product launch playbook and interviewed experts in all the different areas of focus. And you're welcome to grab a free copy of that if you text this uh, keyword to AI hello, uh, 417-695-5479 to get a free copy of the book that details this strategy of growth and optimizations tactically. You've listened to some of that today. Uh, and you'll get some more of it on the tactics if you guys grab that book. Thanks so much for listening. Sorry I spoke so fast, and I hope that was not beyond 10 minutes, but it might have been, so apologies for that. No, this was ridiculous, Ego. This is like the entire tech stack plus the playbook. Obviously, there's a lot more work involved <laughs> once you try to set Obviously. this up yourself. This is like super, super detailed, and uh, this is a lot more than like, because I've dealt with a lot of sellers. This is more than 99.99% of sellers are doing so it's obviously why you also oh, obvious why you guys are winning i'm just curious what else you have on that bookshelf there i see good to great what other books are you <laughs> yeah that's good to great that is a wonderful case study for businesses that went from mediocre from good and how they became great even as a 10 year old book or older it is extremely relevant because one of the case studies features walgreens and if you've paid attention to walgreens recently they're actually going from great to good to trash <laughs> So how are they trashing their business? Well, we'll read good to great, figure out how they became great, take the lessons from that and go forward. If you ever want to know about heaven, that's a great book over there. And then if you want to know about facing your giants, which is a great book from Max Licato that has to do with giants in your mind, giants in your life, things we make into giants and how to overcome them. Very powerful and uh, definitely encourage you guys to check those books out. No, great presentation. Thank you for that. All right, uh, Claude, you, you're uh, next. I don't think we can hear you. Can you guys hear him? Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, sorry. I, I, I started saying I just took a note of this uh, facing your giants. I'll just have to, to look that one up. So you see my screen, right? Yes, we do. Okay, excellent. So what I'm going to be doing uh, in the next 10 minutes or so is build on what Max uh, started today. And is this quite popular topic uh, recently, the topic of this new research paper that Amazon released recently of Cosmo. One thing I want to clarify, I've seen online some people uh, mentioning the fact that this is a white paper. This isn't really a white paper. This is a legit research paper. There's actually 11 researchers working on this, 10 of them from Amazon Research. So this is really something that's quite serious. And as you'll see towards the end, the results of this are also quite impressive and they, they really have an impact onto the, the Amazon business. Now, today's agenda, um, as I said, is, is trying to explain this quite complex way um, or algorithm that Amazon is trying to implement in the backend to serve better recommendations and basically make more sales for them and for their 
sellers, uh, sellers or vendors. So first part, the evolution of search, I want to take it one step back and kind of walk you through what I think is the evolution of search. And then we're going to be diving deep, let's say in this uh, short time frame, onto the Cosmo framework and the Cosmo framework components. And then at the end present what I think is the impact of this new, uh, this new approach towards search. The evolution of search. Um, we're historically moving from keyword search, which is this area here. And I think we're currently somewhere in here in between keyword search and semantic search. So historically the search results page shows results for two use cases. One of them is, is A. So basically the search system of Amazon knows that iPhone is a smartphone and author of is basically uh, Victor Hugo is the author of uh, Notre Dame de Paris. Okay, so that's the kind of basic approach the search algorithm used to have and it still has partially, but now with the introduction of Rufus and, uh, and Cosmo, we're seeing this transition to the semantic search. As Max showed, there's now new results in the search results page that are hyper-personalized. And they're hyper-personalized because Amazon has new knowledge about the product. So in the end, long story short, Cosmo, as the title of the paper says, it is generating common sense knowledge to serve the uh, search system of, of Amazon. So we're moving from query product, searching for something and most probably looking for the product factual information. So this product is a smartphone. When somebody searches for smartphones, I should show these products because they're smartphones. So from query to product. And then I think the keyword of night is intent. Dorian was actually uh, speaking quite a lot about this intent. And I think this is exactly where the that direction is going. It's all about intent. And in the end, Cosmo and this uh, algorithm that Amazon is uh, is working on is trying to extract as accurate as possible intent from the search query to the product uh, acquisition. So there's these use cases that uh, Max was also showing. And I think this is something that all sellers um, or brand owners should should pay attention moving on on uh, on Amazon. So that's how I that's how I see the future. We're definitely moving into this new era of semantic search. Now let's look over the Cosmo framework, um, and this is a, a an extract from the from the paper itself. So Cosmo focuses on understanding user intens intentions from massive behavior data. So we have what the paper says is about ten percent of U.S. traffic that this study has been analyzing so we you can imagine we have over a couple of two months of, of, of a few months so you can imagine we have quite a bit of user behavior that this research paper has been uh, working with to to come up with this uh, with this cosmos so there's quite a lot of user behaviors and they're actually looking for two things or two kind of approaches here one of them is co-buy behavior when users are buying two products together, the system has to make information about why are users buying these, these two products together? What's behind the intent that made them buy these two products? So that's one thing. The second thing is search buy. The users are searching for something and they end up buying something. What's behind this? And in the end, that's exactly what this Cosmo is all about. It's this large amount of user behavior. You put LLMs on top of it and you try to make LLMs generate knowledge about these two types of behaviors, the co-buy and the search buy. And in the end, you're basically expanding the knowledge about the products that you you have uh, uh, for the, or Amazon has for the products on, on Amazon. So today's presentation will move on with two parts. One of them is how's the knowledge generation actually happening in, in the backend? And then two, how is the knowledge refinement so that this uh, this Cosmo algorithm is is round up and it, it's able to generate the results that I'll show you at the at the end. So knowledge generation, there's actually three parts to it. There's uh, relation aware prompts. So basically, it's designed to extract knowledge from the user behavior. So there's a bunch of behaviors, as I said, and then the LLM is asked, why do users buy a camera case and a screen protector together? And then it generates some knowledge. So this knowledge is, is stored somewhere, and then you'll see later on that this is actually uh, tested and it's filtered out to see if this common knowledge that's generated by the LLMs actually makes sense, and if it's actually improving uh, the, the knowledge that Amazon has about, about its products. Second part is seed relations. So of course, 
other than is a and author of it also amazon also has information such as this is used for this is capable of this a uh, this is, is some kind of a product or this can uh, cause some kind of a, an action to also generate these uh, this diverse and high quality knowledges and then lastly there's frequent pattern mining which is analyzing the data for common patterns and of course the system has to be quite um, efficient as of the 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 computing power that's that's using and this paper mentions that they they work actually quite good with this because it's it's quite efficient in terms of the of the computing power that uh, that is uh, using and then lastly here uh, using also frequent uh, pattern mining the system is manually summarizing uh, this into structured knowledge the second part of it is knowledge refinement so after the llm has been generating all this knowledge and maybe sometimes hallucinating, you have to refine this to make sure that it's actually accurate. Because in the end, remember, the goal of this is to add this on the search of Amazon to make sure you have better recommendations, improve the conversion, and basically make more sales. So you have to really make sure that the system is not hallucinating and the results that you're showing on the search page are very accurate. But this is done through knowledge refinement. First one, there's two options here. You do rule-based. So you use sentence segmentation and uh, this perplexity scores, which is basically the confidence that the model or the algorithm has that the next word is generating is, is accurate or not. Or the similarity filtering. So you'll, you're filtering using, um, this is actually an in-house LLM that Amazon uh, has here to filter out similar or uh, but unhelpful uh, knowledge. Now, on top of it, Maybe uh, some of you know, maybe some of you don't, but generally in training LLMs, um, you have to involve humans as well. And humans are very important because that's the extra layer you put on top to validate the model. And as an example, I can also give you the fact that even the images that Tesla is using for self-driving, for example, these images were um, annotated by humans as well. Now they're self-annotated because they, they're basically learning from the annotations that the humans are making. But there's also humans involved in this um, in this process. So this is the last step to validate the system and make sure again that the system is not um, hallucinating. Now, what are two axes, let's say, to make sure that the content or the knowledge that this system is generating is actually qualitative, or it actually is as good as it can be? There's two axes you can uh, you can look at it. One of them is plausibility, and this checks or measures whether the knowledge makes sense um, and could be true given on some kind of context. It's easy for humans, it's quite difficult for LLMs. One example of high plausibility here is customers offer buy sunscreen with beach towels because sunscreen protects against sunburn at the beach. So while this makes sense for us, for a system it might not make sense. So that's why you have to make sure that the output of this has a high plausibility. And an example of a low plausibility system is one that would give something like customer buy winter coats with swimsuits because winter coats are waterproof. So that doesn't make any sense. It's not plausible. It's not an, an output that you can actually use for anything uh, to, to recommend the products on search. The other axis is typicality. And this measures whether the knowledge aligns with what is typically observed in similar situations. A high typicality example is customers often buy bread and butter together because they are commonly used together in meals. So that's typical. A low typicality example would be customers buy laptops and kitchen knives because they both help with daily tasks. So this is definitely not this is definitely not why consumers would buy laptops and, and kitchen knives in the same purchase. So you have to basically remove this kind of um, hallucination of the system. To recap, semantic search implies behaviors and intent behind keywords and that's where I think the Keplo uh, that Dorian was uh, was showing, I think, is is quite important because the way to look at it is while Amazon is working in the back end with Cosmo to make sure they understand as much as possible about your products, you can still do your best to feed the right content to the to the system to then basically make the life of the of the system easier. So that's where I think this. Uh, this tool Keplo can can actually fit pretty well in this uh, in this future that we're seeing with semantic search. Second point is, it will become very important what a customer searches and what it ends up buying, as well as the products that are purchased together. So of course you can do your best with with content, improving, fitting as much as you can. 
But then in the end, it seems like in the future, it will play an important role, the behavior of the customers themselves. So if they end up buying a weird mix of products, Amazon will still recommend this weird mix of products, although you most probably don't think about it, no matter how many uh, user interviews you do and how many studies you do about your product, unless you're able to actually identify this specific behavior that happens on, on Amazon. Point number three, I think an improved version of, of Cosmo would bring more satisfaction to the customers because they'll get better products recommended. Uh, they will reduce the returns. They will improve the, the rating. So I think everybody is, is, is winning in this game. I think one question that's still up in, up in the air is how much will the system be biased and how much can you actually hack it? I don't think we have an answer to this. I think this is still something that's that's floating and considering it can hallucinate, it can hallucinate, but be still be biased. And by this bias, I mean, it can maybe for some reason recommend some specific brand, but we won't be able to know why exactly that happens because in the end, this, this is going to be a, a, a black box. And last point here is the more consistent the behavior. So if you're in a category in which the behavior is consistent, I think the algorithm would would basically be able to understand easier uh, what the intent is behind that and be able to recommend your products easier. Now, in terms of impact, I think this is quite fascinating. And if you think about it, the result of 11 researchers from Amazon working on something can actually bring an additional 5.1 billion on the top line of the Amazon revenue. And that is because in the paper, they state, they state that... Uh, in test, Cosmo generated an increase of 0.7%. And if you think about it, Amazon last year had a GMV of 729 billion. So full scale, if this growth is kept, this is bringing 5.1 billion additional revenue for Amazon. I think this is quite impressive for a tool or a research um, project um, that Amazon is just uh, doing with the uh, with the researchers. And then point number two in terms of impact here, I think there will be a shift in terms of the search navigation. And the paper is presenting here the fact that we're moving from product-centric taxonomies to customer uh, use case taxonomies. And you can see here in the example, if somebody is searching for camping, the, there is this new navigation bar here that already gives some hints over what they might be interested in only for the keyword of camping. So it doesn't go traditionally into camping, okay, tents and uh, and all this. It tries to understand the con the intent and then it provides the examples of what might might it be behind the the intent that these these users are having. So it's it's a quite complex topic. Uh, I'm going to wrap it up here. I think it's something that we definitely have to uh to watch. I don't think Keyword search will completely be gone in a year or two, but I think moving on, we definitely have to pay attention to how Rufus is working and how all these shopping assistants are actually working because imagine only if ChatGPT is able to connect to the Amazon's API, imagine how much change can that bring and how much different would this shopping assistance uh, be to, to what we would consider now traditional uh, keyword search and the, the search results page. I think the future looks different. How exactly it looks, personally, I can have some assumptions, but I think it, it's it's still quite tricky to to west to 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 estimate. So that was it from from my end. Right. No, this was great. This is super useful. Uh, the actual deep dive that you did there with like the plausibility and the uh, like perplexity scores and everything else and the actual examples are super useful. I'm not technical myself, but this was super easy to follow through with. To understand and I'll probably be reading the actual research papers myself now because this turned out to be a lot more interesting than I first um, understood. But yeah, that's pretty much it for the presentations. We do have a couple questions from the audience and I did see someone raise his hand halfway through your presentation. So if, they're, if they want to do that again, we can uh, take a question from them. If not, I'm going to go through the questions that we've gotten from the audience so far. So the first question goes to e-content and it's when will Cosmo be rolled out? Well, as, as Claudia just said, it's it's already been rolled out. Uh, they said in the science paper it's been tested on ten percent of US traffic in February. So, uh, I I have customers who come to me 
and say, I was tracking very well on XYZ keyword, and then I saw a massive dip, something's happened with the algorithm, and we work with them, we fix them. Uh, we're going to get some case studies on this uh, out shortly, but yeah, I think it's live and ready at the moment. Sure, sure. Next questions for Dorian. And uh, they're asking you how accurate are the tests, uh, the tests that you mentioned earlier? Sorry again? The tests that you mentioned earlier, they said how accurate are these tests? You mean in what terms accurate? That's the question. Let me see. I would be more specific. It's hard to say accurate. In yeah, accurate. in terms of Kaplow. So it says for Kaplow, how accurate are these tests and how do they compare to regular tests? That's the question. Okay, gotcha. So the tests we make are actually on brand uh, in brand experiments. So what Kaplow does is uh, it, it sweeps through vast amounts of data on, on Amazon and then collects or it basically, uh, you, you probably, Max probably knows this and other guys, it basically picks up all the entities, um, picks up all the entities and creates uh, and groups them and creates, uh, creates uh, those intent based keywords. So, um, so that's quite, quite accurate, but at the end of the day, these are all, uh, you know, you, you have to test everything. Yeah, it, these are all just, you know, initial, initial, not maybe initial, but these are just, uh, this is just data. It needs to be tested. So the test that you need to run, uh, uh, we all we usually do that on in brand experiments, manage experiments in seller central. Um, they, we, I would say run them for six to eight weeks. Uh, A-B tests, you know, if it's titles, if it's main images, and make sure that, you know, uh, you arrive at a good confidence level, st statistical significance of those tests. These are really, really good, uh, as long as you test them for long enough. I hope that answered the question. Great, right, yeah, it's perfect. So next question is for me. Uh, it says, should I go with an agency or with a PPC software company? So it depends, depends on number one, your size and what your own team structure looks like. So if you have like a head of marketplaces or like an e-commerce manager or someone actually watching the Amazon account, I just go directly to the actual PPC software because you already have someone to keep an eye on things, someone who knows what they're doing. And they just need like an extra hand pretty much to keep everything running and at the correct level of efficiency. If you don't though, you could go through an agency and it's likely that the agency is already using a PPC software. So I'd probably say like 60 to 70 or even 80% of agencies. I don't have the actual numbers. This is my assumption are currently using PPC software. So it's likely that if you go through an agency anyway, you are going to be using some type of tool. Right. The question after that goes to Neil. Uh, and it says, what are the key technological trends in 2024 that Amazon sellers should integrate into their business strategies to stay competitive? Product innovation is a natural byproduct of all brands. So what I think is people tend to get a little complacent because the product's been working and you take a lot of effort to get it going. And then you're like, well, now that it's going, I don't want to touch it. So I'm just going to leave it there. And then they kind of wait a little long before they start developing new products or testing other product lines. So I would encourage everybody that the process and pipeline of testing and product launching and optimization is the economic engine that churns this machine. And you should really never stop doing it. You should never stop looking for ways to optimize your listings in competition with other people in the market, either new or existing in the marketplace to ensure your compliancy uh, growth and, and you know capitalization are being used smartly. Uh, and then I would always elevate brands above certain product lines. If you sell a $30 version of the product, you can sell a 60 and a $90 version. The only reason you don't believe that right now, if you're hearing me, is your limiting belief, not mine, because I know it's possible. So at the end of the day, you have to elevate your realization that if you could sell a 30, you could sell a 60, you can sell a 90. You just have to get in there and find out which type, shape, variation, et cetera, and your account and your time and your market will be the one that grows. Keep innovating, keep elevating, get the profits up, get your optimizations up and focus on continuized improvements and continue to move new products in. The more products you put in the marketplace, the better. Last ad I saw was around 76% of all private label sellers only have five SKUs in their system selling, okay? You may have additional SKUs, but make no mistake, I've told many CFOs and company owners to go in, look at the bottom line of their SKU level and just cut the bottom line off. And what will happen in 30 and 45 days is those low performing SKUs are dragging your entire seller health down, account down, even if you have green lights across the board. As soon as you remove those SKUs from your account, everything else will get a lift, okay? 
So you need to cut and optimize and don't hang on, don't marry your products, keep working through the product process uh, and keep evolving those product opportunities. And that will be the biggest key to any tools and solutions and opportunities to not miss Cosmo, but take advantage of PPC and automation that you heard about today is just keep evolving and keep moving. Don't get complacent. Perfect. No, I agree with 100%. The final question here is for Claudio, and it is, what can you do to prepare for the era of semantic search? Well, I think one thing is try to use Kiplo. I've never used it, but it seems like it's one one option here. So, so that's for sure. It's it's one way of of looking at it. But in the end, is knowing your audience. I think it becomes super important to know your audience and who you are selling to. And I'm coming from a consulting background and we had these conversations with clients. And I think generally brands don't know exactly who they're selling to. They know their product very well. Oh, my technical, you know, the technical aspects of these products are X, Y, Z. This is the product sheet info and, and, and all that and all the dimensions and all the all the information. But I think they, they struggle with who their audience is and who their persona is, who their uh, ICP is. And I think this this would become super important because if you know the audience, then you would be able to filter down and understand, okay, what are the behaviors? What is the intent? And how can I make sure my content is uh, is, is tailored to, to that? But again, th there's two parts to it. There's one thing you can control. There's the other thing you cannot. The one thing you can control is what's what's on the product page. What you cannot control is the behavior of the of the buyers of your product. And remember, there's, there's two things. There's products that are both together and then there's search by. So whatever the, the customers buying your product are searching for and they end up your product, in the end, this will also shape the, the, the kind of intent and, and the behavior that the algorithm will understand. So I hope this, uh, this answers the question. Yeah, no, it's perfect. And it sounds like the new semantic search updates are just gonna force a lot of people to do what they were supposed to do anyway, like research their customers, understand what they're looking for, why they're buying. That's what we've been doing for almost half a decade right now. And it sounds like a lot more people are just going to be forced to do that or use tools like Kaplow, which are going to help them do that. But that's it for the webinar. Thank you all. All of you had amazing presentations and I learned a lot today. So thank you for sharing this content with us. The full recording will be available on YouTube and the LinkedIn profiles for everyone who spoke on this webinar are in the chat box. So you guys can check them out after. And I'll also put it in the description of the YouTube video. But thank you for speaking or for listening to us speak. And I hope you guys have a great rest of your day. See you again soon. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.